Hello there, my name is Trish Lynch from IOHR in London. Thanks for being with us for another episode of our Human Rights TV, putting human rights into focus. The UN has recently claimed that all sides in Yemen have created violations of international law, which has led to what is considered the largest humanitarian crisis that the world has ever seen. 10,000 people have already been killed, 22.2 million people need urgent assistance, and every 10 minutes a child under five dies of preventable causes. With us today is Helen Lackner, who is an expert on Yemen, but has also had a chance to understand the country while working there as a consultant in rural development. Helen, it's good to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Now, Helen, you have lived on and off in Yemen over a 45 year period for 15 years. And in that time, you have seen many changes within the country. And in your book, Yemen in Crisis, you said that you have seen the total disintegration of the country. Tell me what you mean by that and how have we got to this stage in Yemen? But basically what has happened is that you've had a set of state policies and internationally supported policies in Yemen, particularly since unification of the two previous states in 1990, which have very much undermined the fabric of the country and prevented it from developing any kind of autonomy economically particularly and socially. I think one should not pretend that the Yemenis have had no say in it. Uh, the regime of former President Ali Abdullah Saleh was very much in favor of these neoliberal policies and supported them and basically these policies in Yemen did what they've done in many other places which is made life extremely pleasant for a microscopic minority while making it increasingly unpleasant for the vast majority of the population. Is that the rate of population increase has been extremely high. When the country unified in 1990, it had about 11 million people. Mm -hmm. It now has 28 million people. And it's also a country that has extremely limited natural resources. In addition to limited natural resources, it also suffers from very low quality standards of education, which meant that it didn't have the options that some other states have taken of developing an economy based on knowledge on highly educated population. It hasn't had that option. And it has also had, and still has, more than 70% of the population living in rural areas, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But the fact of the matter is that there's not enough agricultural potential to support these people. And, of course, there's a major long-term crisis in Yemen, which is the lack of water. UN experts have blamed all parties for the ongoing crisis and have called for Iran to stop providing missiles and arms to the Houthi and for the US and the UK to stop supporting the Saudis with arms. What can you tell me about the Houthis backed by Iran and what we hear of torture, um, enforced disappearances and the recruitment of child soldiers? I think on this issue, and I think the, the new report from the UN Human Rights Organization is fairly clear on that. The Houthis are very clearly and obviously responsible for a significant number of disappearances and illegal imprisonment, particularly of journalists and people who have expressed any opposition. And they're also seriously involved in um, child recruitment. I think that report makes it quite clear that they are not alone with these positions. The Saudi-led coalition plays as an equal role. Clearly, in terms of child recruitment, they are found on both sides. What about the enforced disappearances where people simply vanish? Yes, and th these are happening on both sides. And absolutely, I mean, they are horrible. You're a specialist in water management and in poverty alleviation, but you've also said that there are many other internal reasons in, in rural areas why food insecurity is such a problem. Could you tell us what those problems might be in the rural areas? Yeah, I think one thing one, that one needs to remember is that even before this crisis started, you had more than half the population unable to survive. And basically one of the things that I saw happening over the, since the beginning of this century in working in rural areas has been a shift between families living from their agriculture and livestock, or at least having agriculture and livestock as their main source of income, 
to finding that the main source of income became the labor, usually fairly unskilled labor, of young men, or even less young men, but usually men, very, very, very rarely women, mm -hmm. in the towns and cities. And of course, out migration, whether that was possible, but let's, it's become a much less significant factor in terms of the economy. Basically, this happened through a number of factors, partly population increase, which I mentioned earlier, also very much as a consequence of population increase, the increasingly small size of most holdings, as well, of course, as climate change and water issues. I believe that the major crisis now, and when we talk about potential famine, I, my feeling is that it's already happening in many places, and that is in the more remote and poorer mountain and rural areas, most of which are under the control of the Houthis, if you look at the geography of the country. IOHR have conducted extensive research on Yemen and education and children is a major problem. What can you tell me about that? Well, I think, yes, education is an absolutely major, major problem. It has been for a long time. I mean, education standards in Yemen have always been very low and school attendance, particularly for girls. But the impact of the war has been very much, number one, a lot of schools have been closed. Mm -hmm partly because they've been turned into homes for IDPs or other emergency circumstances. A lot of schools have been destroyed, so they're no longer operational. Teachers are amongst the 1.2 million Yemeni sta government staff who have not been paid. Hence, they have very limited incentive to go and work. Children are afraid to go to work. Parents are afraid to send their children to work, uh, sorry, to school unless the, in case the school gets bombed, and this has happened, schools have been mm -hmm. hit. So basically, the education system, which was pretty bad to start with, is very much worse now. Well, the information that we had was that last year, 900,000 people were affected by the cholera epidemic. Yes. Yes. Last year, we announced that the cholera epidemic in Yemen was the largest cholera epidemic that the world had ever seen. But there's good news on that front. What has happened very recently is there's been some research done, um, particularly by the British Met Office in combination, in association with a university, I forget which one, which has developed mechanisms for predicting the likelihood and the locations of likely cholera outbreaks, basically by combining meteorological data with social and economic data. And I think this has been used already in Yemen. And the number of cases that have been declared in this year, this rainy season, because these things get much worse in the rainy mm -hmm. season, have been incomparably lower. I, I'm afraid I don't have the figure in mind. But the last figure I saw was something like 2,000 cases in the last few months, which compared to last year is less than 1% probably. You know, it's a very big improvement. And you know, a, a, small, a small ray of light, I think, in a particularly glum situation. Yemen is a battleground of two parties. On one hand, we have the Saudi-led coalition. On the other hand, we have the Houthi militants who are backed by Iran. Recently, we witnessed the Saudis bombing a school bus full of school children, many casualties. Now, the UN has blamed both parties for the ongoing humanitarian crisis. Do you see any political situation that could end this war? Um, at the moment, with great difficulty. And in terms of the solution, one thing that strikes me is that separating the Iran-Saudi Arabia rivalry from the Yemen-specific issues would be a first step, because Yemen has a series of very complex internal issues which brought about the civil war. And that civil war has been made massively worse by the international intervention. So I think that's, you know, the, one way of going somewhere might be to be able to separate this, which is extremely difficult. If you want to look at the internal politics, you know, you really have a very complex situation which arose after the, well, which coalesced after the 2011 uprisings, mm -hmm. which were very big in Yemen and very long lasting in Yemen where you had a, a large group of people who were basically opposing the Saleh regime and its many patronage features and other corruption features. 
And they were eventually supported by the formal opposition, which also included an Islamist group and various other groups. So when the deal which was sponsored by the Gulf Cooperation Council states and the international community in general was achieved in November 2011, part of that deal was designed in such a manner that the likelihood of what happened happening increased because you had the deal included on the one hand a government of national unity in which Saleh's party had 50% of the seats. So Saleh himself abandoned the presidency but he retained leadership of his party and control over 50% of the government. And the other 50% of the government was supposed to be a combination of the official formal opposition which was again a group of parties, plus what they called the new forces of youth, women, civil society, which had emerged in 2011. So one of the elements that really led to the situation was the inability of this government to solve any of the problems that the country faced. It would appear that all efforts at mediation have so far failed. I don't see a peace agreement this year. I agree that Stopping weapons would be to all sides and ammunition would be a great step forward. Objectively, it makes sense for everybody to stop this war tomorrow. You know, the Saudis are not doing very well. They have made, they have serious financial problems. You know, they, they have the whole new economic and social plans of Prince Mohammed bin Salman depend on large quantities of money and, and capital, which, you know, are being eaten into by the Yemen war, which is costing an indeterminate amount because es estimates are variable and there's no official figures on that. So, you know, according to our logic, they should want to stop. The Emiratis are known to want to get out. There's certainly one group who are very keen on continuing, and that's the arms manufacturers and the arms sellers who are all over the world. Mm -hmm but a fair number of them, and the biggest being, as we know, in the States and in Britain and France and such like places. So logically, everybody should want to end. In practice, we also have a group of Yemenis and others who are benefiting from the war. I mean, we have a war economy where, you know, goods are smuggled um, all over the place at the great profit of a small number of people. Well, on that note, we're going to leave it there. Helen Lackner, thank you very much for joining us today on IOHR. And thank you for joining us for another episode of our Human Rights TV, putting human rights into focus. Please keep up to date on our website and our social media feed. And please remember to share to as many people as you can, because we really want to raise awareness. Until next time, goodbye.